Listen to that. Does that sound good? Okay, welcome to the podcast. We've got a new microphone, and uh, I want to thank the patrons, I guess, who paid for it, basically. I hope that improves the quality of the podcast. Uh, Good Sunday morning to you. That's at least when I'm shooting this. Um, Look at this. It's the Walt Whitman episode, as promised. What is it about thinking about Zarathustra that has me thinking about Walt Whitman? And why do we spend so much time in the 19th century? By the way, I have no, I don't have my notes for this episode. I'm just kind of winging it because I used to teach Whitman every semester. And I just figured, like, maybe I can uh, basically just kind of re-upload the, the uh, I almost said sermons, the lectures that I used to give. So to begin with, I'm going to, and I have a couple of slideshows. I'll probably just like have the slides up that I used to have up when I would talk about these talking points. So the first thing is when it comes to Whitman, uh, you should look here at the, if you, if you're not listening, but watching on YouTube at the, um, inscription page in the, I think it's the first edition may have been the second edition of leaves of grass. I say that because he, printed, I think, 10 editions and revised each one of them through from about 1855 when he published the first one through his death in 1892, and basically just kind of added to the original text, grew it until it was, you know, a big book-sized thing. I think there were only 10 poems in the original. But Song of Myself is, of course, the, the, uh, the main not the title poem, but the, the sort of magnum opus of, the, of Leaves of Grass. And so if you look at this inscription page, you see not Walt Whitman's name, but his body. And don't you love that posture? That sort of contrapost, how do they say, contraposto, whatever they call that in Italian. That comfortable, relaxed, easy, uh, informal look. Where, you know, even, even in 1855, most poets would have been depicted from the shoulders up. They would have been, it's to emphasize the head the brain, the mind. Whitman returns us to the body a little bit. Now look, I'm also very, very aware of the, the, uh, the psyop, basically, uh, that is that we must mention that Whitman's gay uh, as soon as we start teaching him. And like that starts in eighth grade now. And, uh, you know, that turns a lot of people off, to be honest. And I think that's um, some, something you got to get over. I mean, you can think of Whitman as Hellenic if you want to. If that helps, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, his poetry needs to be considered sort of separate from that. So just like grow up a little bit for a minute. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the Walt Whitman. Um, I want to read a lot to you from Song of Myself, and actually, the most maybe the best way to start this is probably to think about what he writes in the preface to Leaves of Grass. And the preface is, like, ostensibly in prose, but it reads like poetry, um, very much like parts of Zarathustra, interestingly, right? So instead of getting, you know, sort of... um, Well, we, we sort of get neither. It's not philosophical prose, but it's also not exactly only uh, poetry. So listen to this claim. This is what I consider to be Whitman's like leaves of grass, 10 commandments, you know? Um, So he says halfway through the preface, this is what you shall do. Love the earth and sun and the animals. Despise riches. Give alms to everyone that asks. Stand up for the stupid and crazy. Devote your income and labor to others. Hate tyrants. Argue not concerning God. Have patience and indulgence toward the people. Take off your hat to nothing known or unknown or to any man or number of men. Go freely with powerful, uneducated persons and with the young and with the mothers of families. Read these leaves, that is the, the book, the pages, in the open air, every season of every year of your life. 
Re-examine all you have been told at school or church or in any book. Dismiss whatever insults your own soul, and your very flesh shall be a great poem. That is, you got to say, I mean, again, this might be false prophecy. I did have these great twin girl students who were homeschooled Baptists one time, and teaching Emerson, uh, they, I, you know... <laughs> Uh, who I just assumed everyone loved, they told me, no, this guy may be a false prophet. He's, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing or whatever. And I thought that was interesting because it may be true that you can read him that way. And, and if that's true, then certainly Whitman also. I should say, I mean, Whitman, like, Whitman, ga like, literally gathered up disciples in his lifetime. People made pilgrimages to touch the hem of his garments. Like, that's how influential he was on Americans and even, you know, in, in England in particular. So why, like, what, well, first of all, I mean, he's not a Christian in the sense that, um, in fact, let me pull up that poem while we're doing this. We could read that one together, a shorter version. I think that helps, um, to him that was crucified. All right. So I mean, why is Whitman a heretic? Like, what makes him a heretic? Whoops. And uh, why do we, like, still think he's interesting? Well, it's because his heresy is really interesting. I mean, that's the, that's the reality of it. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean, well, y you know, <laughs> hold on. Sorry, I'm trying to do too many things here. And my microphone can only sit right in front. All right, so here we go. To him that was crucified. This is a poem by Walt Whitman. I'm going to put it up on your screens. And we're going to think about it together. Okay? This is not from Leaves of... Or I don't know. I don't think it was included in Leaves of Grass initially. But it's not part of Song of Myself. But sometimes you can read Whitman's shorter poems. Just to get a feel for what he's thinking. And then you understand that Song of Myself. This 52 sectioned almost epic. I mean, it's like, uh, it takes probably about three, four hours, three hours to read. And the way to do it is to take it out in a hammock under a tree in early June and just decide I'm going to read this whole poem today. Okay. But you don't have three hours right now. So listen to this poem. To him that was crucified. My spirit to yours, dear brother. Do not mind because many sounding your name do not understand you. I do not sound your name, but I understand you. I specify you with joy, O oh my comrade, to salute you and to salute those who are with you before and since, and those to come also, that we labor together, transmitting the same charge and succession. We few equals indifferent of lands, indifferent of times. We, enclosers of all continents, all castes, allowers of all theologies, compassionators, perceivers, rapport of men. We walk silent among disputes and assertions, but reject not the disputers nor anything that is asserted. We hear the bawling and din, we are reached at by divisions, jealousies, recriminations on every side. They close peremptorily upon us to surround us, my comrade. Yet we walk unheld, free, the whole earth over, journeying up and down till we make our ineffaceable mark upon time and the diverse eras, till we saturate time and eras that the men and women of races, ages to come, may prove brethren and lovers as we are. Whew. I mean, man, what a poem that is. To him that was crucified. So he basically says, like, most people don't understand you, Jesus, but I do, even though I don't say your name, like, probably out of reverence. And then he talks about this, like, moving international brotherhood that that sort of gets it. I don't know how else to put it, but like the, 
you would say the woke, the truly, like the saved, you know, that's who Whitman imagines to be his people. The Amer As he says at the beginning, listen to the beginning of the preface here. The preface, he says, first two sentences of the preface say, and, and this is prose, not poetry. America does not repel the past or what it has produced under its forms or amid other politics or the idea of castes or the old religions, accepts the lessons with calmness, is not so impatient as has been supposed that the slough still sticks to opinions and manners and literature while the life which served its requirements has passed into the new life of the new forms, perceives that the corpse is slowly born from the eating and sleeping rooms of the house, perceives that it waits a little while in the door, that it was fittest for its days, that its action has descended to the stalwart and well-shaped heir who approaches, and that he shall be fittest for his days. The Americans of all nations at any time upon the earth have probably the fullest poetical nature. Do you understand how radical that is? Like that's, what's he saying? Whitman is saying that America is an idea. This is one of those things that drives the, you know, sort of uh, hard right, reactionary right, trad cath right, crazy because they they don't like the idea that there will be a movable feast an identity that shifts that looks different that talks different but what whitman is imagining is that of course those things will change look there are as i was thinking on my walk this morning there are only a couple of alternatives to that right one of them is that you try to in incorporate like the whole of humanity this is like the farm aid we are the world Unitarianism, right? We're all going to come together as one. This is never going to happen. You and I know this well because, like, it requires uh, first ostracizing the bad people and eventually, like, genociding them. And even then, you have to do it by, like, mechanistic control in order to, uh, like, stave off the moment that comes inevitably when someone disagrees and there's dissent and, you know, Anne Hutchinson has to leave the colony or whatever. And so, like, that's one possibility, but it's not a possibility. We write that one off. Then the alternatives would be a kind of, like, ethnic nationalism, which, first of all, like, is, would put you in, I mean, you know, like, uh, you'd, you get in trouble with the rest of the world because they're trying to do we are the worldism, right? And they don't like that you're an isolationist and a racist or whatever. So that's the first part of that problem. The other part is it doesn't, like that kind of, it's like white people would be my racial group, but again, 98% of them don't know what's going on and I don't want them on my commune. Do you understand? So that's a part of the problem with that. And then another alternative would be to try to do some kind of creedal identitarianism where you go like, okay, we aren't like necessarily a racial group and you know uh we're not even necessarily the people on this soil of this blood or whatever but we are the people who believe this creed and i mean that like for you could say that might work you know this is sort of what uh like um i guess what christianity was trying to do the problem is either it becomes mandatory, in which case people don't really believe the creed, in which case it doesn't really transform them into the person that you really want to be brothers with, you know, or like um, uh, they are, or you just like force it on them. You just do Holy Roman Empire Inquisition stuff and like they all profess the creed, but again, none of them really believe it. And so this leaves us with the Whitmanian interpretation of jesus which is that he didn't intend to start like a uh like a like, like a club that would have formal initiation that you like you kind of have to sign up and now you're one of us and that's it no he he was one of the few who like understood it forever sort of so Whitman is like absolutely democratic, right? He is he he gets rid of all hierarchies here, including things like uh you know, rhyme and rhythm and so on. 
Now, I, like, I understand who I'm talking to. You know, my audience doesn't like that. My, am I, and I'm not sure I like it either, to be honest. Like, to be honest, I'm, I could go either way on this. But Whitman definitely played a shaping role in sort of what I consider to be my liberalism. You know, like, that, that is to say, I am an anti-legalist. Like, I don't believe that any series of illegal reinforcements, you know, even from a philosopher, like I was reading the book that Arvel recommended on Pythagoras the other day, and apparently Pythagoras went back to, um, was it Samos or Croton, and he, you know, was honored by the people there, and he tried to give these, he gave these rules, he gave them these laws that, uh, like, you know, he was, he was, one of those ancient lawgivers that set things straight, like Solon or whatever. And I'm skeptical of that, I guess. But, you know, now, I mean, you might say, well, what if you really set the laws in, with, in, in keeping with natural law? Well, that's a difficult thing to do because one of the, like, for example, like, uh, let's, let's consider marriage as, you know, natural law. Like, well, natural law to me suggests that you know, puberty is basically the beginning of the sex drive. And realistically, among men, I mean, how long are you going to be able to hold on committing no violation of what would be natural law there? You understand? Not very long. And so this suggests, well, basically we need like pair bonding, mating, marriage for life, starting for men at about 13 or something. This is impossible. This is never going to happen. And so you have these problems of nature, human nature, and legalism where it's like we want to say, look, basically don't make babies until you're 20 or 22 or whatever and you can kind of take care of them. But the sex drive disagrees and so you're you're trying to like you're you're trying to square a circle here with legalism. It there's always and what I'm saying is there's always going to be violations of it. And so what you need you could you know that's not to say there shouldn't be laws, but you have to have an understanding that you're not going to cure every like ailment of the human species. You're not going to get rid of like all degeneracy by enacting a certain um, sequence of laws. And so listen to how Whitman conceives of something like the priesthood. He says, this is still in the preface, by the way. He says, there will soon be no more priests. Their work is done. They may wait a while, perhaps a generation or two, dropping off by degrees. A superior breed shall take their place. The gangs of cosmos and prophets en masse shall take their place. A new order shall arise, and they shall be the priests of man and every man shall be his own priest. Now, sometimes, again, in this, especially among, like, trad-cath people, it, it, you, will, you will find people saying, look, like, Protestantism is to blame for everything that's bad in society. And the problem that I have with that is it, it supposes that Protestantism was, like, a mistake, that the Protestants didn't really understand what wreckage they were causing. But as I was saying in the last episode with Nietzsche, destruction is part of creation. You need to get rid of detritus. You need to cut out the cancer or the dead institution or, you know, or so on. And so part of what Whitman, what Nietzsche, what these guys are doing, they're saying, yes, Protestantism and, and more. We need more of it, right? Like turn it up to 10 on the dial. It's an inter I'm not saying this is the solution, by the way. I'm just, right now, relax. I'm just giving you a summary of what Whitman was doing, and it's very clear that this kind of perfect democratization of consciousness is part of the project here. And it started with Emerson, of course, because with Emerson you're going to get, you know, the, um, the oversoul, which is, it's accessible by everyone, but not everyone accesses it. So it's like only Jones Very gets it. He's the one who sees the vision. And the same thing goes for someone like Whitman. So like Emerson basically calls for, we need a poet of our own. We need, you know, an American bard. And I think Whitman answered that. Like he gave us the answer. And what happens is, you know, if you read Whitman enough, his vision 
gets into your mind and you start to you start to think this you start to think look i am one of the americans of all times and places throughout the earth like the people who love trees and grass and that natural stance i showed you of whitman's at the beginning and athleticism and good hugs and soup around the campfire you know what i mean like real life these are our people this is who we are now you will always probably be wandering in that sense but you'll also always find your people wherever you go because and this is the point is like th this is an eternal this is why i put the short up this is an eternal voice in the sense that like even if we lost all of Whitman, even if we lost Song of Myself, it's going to recur because it's inevitable, because it's true, because it exists at some level. Is it for you? Is it for me? I'm not sure. I, I don't love what America is doing right now. I think we are kind of falling apart and it's going to cause suffering and probably wars and death and famine and all those kinds of things. It's bad. It's, it's a problem. But if and when those things come... My hope is that I'll be able to recognize people who are on the same page as I am by, you know, um, it's like that scene at the end of the road when the dad dies and the little boy finally finds these other people and the boy who's like 10 years old says to them, do you carry the fire? And they kind of look at each other like, what does that mean? And then they go, yeah, I think, I think we do carry the fire actually. And there's a kind of recognition among these people right so the recognition in this very aristotelian sense it can happen uh <clears throat> among spiritual equals and i know that you know that this ha like this 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 is not limited to white people or to christians or anything like that like you've certainly met someone who doesn't share your immediate identity that gets it that like has that even keeled frequency that you want to get with and that's i think what whitman is calling us to <clears throat> this is the beginning of the poem i hope you've heard it before again like if you've made it to age 30 and never spent two hours reading song of myself like what the fuck are you doing it's it's just a crazy that's that's a failing like you, you failed yourself you've watched a hundred baseball games or something but haven't read this please <clears throat> quote I celebrate myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe the fragrance myself and know it and like it. The distillation would intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. <clears throat> the atmosphere is a perf sorry, the atmosphere is not a perfume. It has no taste of the distillation. It is odorless. It is for my mouth forever. I am in love with it. I would go to the bank by the wood and become undisguised and naked. I am mad for it to be in contact with me. The smoke of my own breath echoes, ripples, and buzzed whispers love root silk thread crotch and vine my respiration and inspiration the beating of my heart the passing of blood and air through my lungs so i hope you get get a sense of i mean first of all there's this i and thou relationship that's established on page one and whitman invites you in and says this shall all be yours also right and there's this, like, first of all, he's, like, only going to do the thing where he goes, loaf with me. That means, like, lie down in the grass, bro. Like, this is not, this, this is not the right medium for what we're doing here with Whitman. Like, you need to slow down, take a breath, and, like, get into it, right? And that's what we're doing with 
like with Walt. That's the way to listen to Walt. Um, it's not an argument so much as like a tone, I think. And that's why, by the way, that's why like um, Emerson talked about when he called for the American poet, he said, look, we need someone who can create not rhymes and meter, but meter making arguments. That, that is to say, if you say what is inevitable and you say it truly, right, as Whitman tries to do, without mediation and you use natural imagery that's eternal then it, it almost doesn't you don't need rhyme the rhyme happens in the images sort of i guess so and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of this i mean in that first section as i said it's very hopefully you catch the images the scent the uh the love root that's the i mean that's the we're talking genitals here crotch and vine like uh what does he say there yeah, the smoke of my own breath. All of this is very physical physical and visceral and, you know, present, right? So that's kind of what we're doing here. Now, if you, if you skip to like the seventh section or so of this, I mean, it is, this is so, like, uh, man, I, I love this poem. Like, I, I want to read every page to you, actually. Like the, um, I don't know whether, to, okay, like, let's see. Trippers, trippers and askers surround me, people I meet, the effect upon me of my early life, of the ward and city I live in, of the nation, the latest news, discoveries, inventions, societies, authors old and new, my dinner, dress, associates, looks, business, compliments, dues, the real or fancied indifference of some man or woman I love, the sickness of one of my folks, or of myself, or ill doing, or loss of so sorry, or loss or lack of money, or depressions or exaltations, they come to me days and nights to go from me again, but they are not the me myself. Apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am stands amused complacent compassionating idle unitary looks down is erect bends an arm on an impalpable certain rest looks with its side curved head curious what will come next both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it Look, man, I love this, but what you got to get is that this is a psychological, spiritual perspective that he's trying to give you. And what I'm saying is, like, I don't want to be part of any political nation where this isn't, uh, like, isn't part of it. I'm not saying it has to be all of it, but, like, there needs to be one day a week or something where we are standing apart from it. We are not politics obsessed. We are not watching CNN all the time. I don't have to have an opinion about those kinds of things, right? I want to, you know, sort of lie down in the grass. I mean, that's the idea here. Where's the scene where he, there's like a, oh, hold on. Take, I'm, I'm, I like the 1855 version best, but it doesn't have the, um, uh, it doesn't have the section breaks, but I, I think it's written the best. I think he overwrought it when he was doing the, um, yeah, so listen to the, okay, so this is in, I think, section seven, if you have the later version of it. This is, this is the sort of semi-infamous, like, oral sex scene from Song of Myself. Of course, this book shocked people, needless to say. In 1855, people couldn't handle this. These are Puritans, basically, in New England reading this. But sex is part of nature, and Whitman understands that. I mind how we lay in June, such a transparent summer morning. You settled your head athwart my hips, and gently turned over upon me, and parted the shirt from my bosom bone, and plunged your tongue to my bare-stripped heart, and reached till you felt my beard, 
and reached till you held my feet. Swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and joy and knowledge that pass all the art and argument of the earth. And I know that the hand of God is the elder hand of my own. And I know that the Spirit of God is the eldest brother of my own. And that all men ever born are also my brothers, and the women my sisters and lovers and that a Kelson of the creation is love. And limitless are leaves, stiff or drooping in the fields, and brown ants in the little wells beneath them, and mossy scabs of the worm fence, and heaped stones, elder, mullen, and pokeweed. That is such an amazing section of poetry. He basically says, look, Sex first, that's the profane, right? The body. And then he goes, swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and joy that pass all understanding. That is biblical spiritualism. So that's pretty amazing already. I mean, you could get good poets who say that from time to time, that like sex is a sacred thing. He sort of says that like it starts with the body, but ultimately it takes me to, you know, a higher love or whatever. But then Whitman being a genius actually returns us to the profane, to the earth. And he says, you know, brown ants, you got to really picture this, but they're on, they're, you know, making love on a blanket in a field next to a worm eaten fence. And when they look up after the holy moment, you know, there's pokeweed and mullen and elder and brown ants And this roller coaster, back and forth, up and down between the sacred and profane, this is how Whitman makes the point that ultimately, like it's it's Emersonian, right? That the world is a uniform hieroglyphic. That that uh, you get it, right? That like that that it's a it's not illusion. It's more than illusion. It's not illusion. It's not Maya. It's parable. The world is parable, if you can look at it the right way. Walt Whitman, an American, one of the roughs, a cosmos, disorderly, fleshy and sensual, eating, drinking, and breeding. No sentimentalist, no stander above men and women or apart from them, no more modest than immodest. Unscrew the locks from the doors, unscrew the doors themselves from their jams. Whoever degrades another degrades me, and whatever is done or said returns at last to me. And whatever I do or say, I also return. Through me the afflatus surging and surging, through me the current and index. I speak the password primeval. I give the sign of democracy. By God, I will accept nothing which cannot have their counterpart of on the same term, sorry, I will accept nothing which all cannot have their counterpart of on the same terms. So, I mean, I get it that you guys who don't love democracy don't love Walt Whitman or something, but it's, he really gives everyone in America a shout out. Everyone in the world almost will feel sort of seen by, um, by this poem. I mean, that's really how it works. It's kind of an amazing attempt to tie together, you know, the whole thing, the whole, like basically human existence. Um, let me see. I got to find, yeah. So I'm going to read you two pieces from the end here. Um, I like this actually while I'm flipping this is what I mean about the eternal man and how I think that the Zarathustra, the overman, is more of not something to come that hasn't been yet, but like it's a returning to righteousness, to rightness, to rectitude, properness, correctness, naturalness, you know? I tramp a perpetual journey. My signs are a rainproof coat and good shoes and a staff cut from the woods. No friend of mine takes his ease in my chair. I have no chair, no church, nor philosophy. 
I lead no man to a dinner table or library or exchange, but each man and each woman of you I lead upon a knoll. My left hand hooks you round the waist. My right hand points to landscapes of continents and a plain public road. Not I, not anyone else can travel that road for you. You must travel it for yourself. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I like it. And I also like that Whitman seems to write this after he has examined, you know, all of the main existing traditional religious traditions. He says, quote, I do not despise you, priests. My faith is the greatest of faiths and the least of faiths. Enclosing all worship ancient and modern, and all between ancient and modern. Believing I shall come again upon the earth after five thousand years. Waiting responses from oracles, honoring the gods, saluting the sun, making a fetish of the first rock or stump, powwowing with sticks in the circle of Obis, helping the Lama or Brahmin as he trims the lamps of the idols, dancing yet through the streets in a phallic procession, wrapped and austere in the woods, a gymnosophist, drinking mead from the skull cup, to Shasta and Veda's admirant, minding the Koran, walking the Teocalus, spotted with gore from the stone and knife, beating the serpent skin drum, accepting the Gospels, accepting him that was crucified, knowing assuredly that he is divine, to the Mass, kneeling, to the Puritan's prayer, rising, sitting patiently in a pew, ranting and frothing in my insane crisis, waiting, dead-like, till my spirit arouses me, looking forth on pavement and land, and outside of pavement and land, belonging to the winders of the circuit of circuits. <clears throat> and I call to mankind, Be not curious about God, for I, who am curious about each, am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death. I hear and behold God in every object, yet I understand God not in the least. Nor do I understand who there can be more wonderful than myself. Why should I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God each hour of the twenty-four and each moment then. In the faces of men and women I see God, and in my own face in the glass. I find letters from God dropped in the street, and every one is signed by God's name. And I leave them where they are, for I know that others will punctually come forever and ever. I feel like this is just, I mean, it's just so much. Like, there should almost be, like, this should just be an intro episode to Walt Whitman. And I, I mean, I've barely scratched the surface. Let me give myself a few minutes to say again what I mean. If the Ubermensch is some future existing thing that is not yet born and no one has ever been it in the past then that requires a, like literally like biological evolution and it begins to seem extremely larpy to me instead if we can imagine the ubermensch is a return to tradition is a return to natural man almost to like enkidu levels if going back to the episode on gilgamesh the the one who can drink at the watering hole the the undomesticated you know the razorback not the fat pink pig this is what Walt Whitman sort of invites us to consider. And it's, again, like I've said about Thoreau, like Emerson, it's sort of terrible that, like, the American transcendentalists, Emerson, Whitman, Thoreau, and others, were so influential 
and yet no one listened to them. Like, we didn't ultimately decide to take that path as a country. We instead laid the rail, synchronized the clocks, and, you know, got on with business, basically, right? Which, look, maybe it's inevitable. Maybe it's inevitable. But, again, like, this idea that we're going to... That, like, when some people... It's, like, it's kind of driving me crazy lately. There's, some, there's this idea that we're going to form some sort of... Either, like, again, either, like, a religious uh, peoplehood and then build the wall around it and that'll be us, or an ethnic peoplehood and build the wall and that'll be us or whatever. Look, like, you know, you could maybe get away with that if you could kind of get people into it without them understanding what it really means in the long run. I mean, I actually think that's what happened in Israel. That's what they're doing in Israel. It's like they decided we're going to be kind of an ethnic religious group and we're going to build the wall around us and expel all the people who aren't us and or treat them as second-class citizens or whatever. And it's like what you find is that, in fact, they're not that asleep. The, the, like half of the Israelis are like, wait a minute, this is terrible. We're basically becoming the oppressor over the Palestinians. And that's because... Maybe they didn't realize it until now. I don't know how this works. I mean, they were, you know, they, whatever. But they're into the second, third generation of trying to be isolationist and, and you know, do the thing where they preserve themselves as a people. And what it means is that you're essentially at war with the rest of the world who would like you to be open and, you know, intermixing and so on with them. And so I guess, like, if you want to go that route, that's fine, but just know that even if you're successful, even if you eventually carve out a, a turf and an identity and you, you know, get the farming up and running and you have a military and stuff, the war is going to happen and it's going to be the war of you against all and you'll probably lose that one. But if you win, it's going to be by like, you know, genociding outsiders, which I mean, it just doesn't seem feasible to me. The alternative is to find your people, like know the people who get it. That's all. I don't know how to put it any better than that. The people who get it. And these are the people who are sort of the, the Ubermensches. These are the or Ubermenschen or whatever it would be, you know? Like I said, I, I mean, geez, I really, I could, I could freestyle five more hours on Whitman. And so what I'll probably do is... Just come back to him every now and then. Do a few more episodes on Song of Myself. Do some on, you know, I'd like to do... Maybe I'll do a, like a Godward short on There Was a Child Went Forth, probably, soon. Anyway, uh, I hope you like the new mic. Thanks for listening. Um, isn't my lighting good? I mean, this lighting is perfect. Anyway, see you next time. Bye-bye.